John, by the grace of God, King of England, Lord of Ireland, Duke of Normandy and Aquitaine and Count of Anjou, to his archbishops, bishops, abbots, earls, barons, justices, foresters, sheriffs, stewards, servants, and to all his officials and loyal subjects, greetings. King John is one of the most infamous kings in English history. When you hear his name, all sorts of negative words come to mind to describe him. Whether it's from modern media or from contemporary chroniclers, such as Matthew Paris, history of William the Marshal, Gerald of Wales, Ralph of Coggeshall, and Roger of Wendover. Modern historians have attempted to cleanse the whitewash of King John's reputation and present a clearer picture of his reign. Rather than John's kingship being condensed into one single point in history, that of the signing of the Magna Carta, as John ruled England for 17 years. 21st century historians aren't trying to reevaluate King John as a misunderstood king, but to provide context on how he became the villain that is within the public consciousness, as he did indeed commit villainous acts and conducted himself cruelly at times. Some actions he took were on par with his predecessors, and in some cases, he succeeded far more than his father Henry and his brother Richard. Yet, it's difficult to give a precise and straightforward story of John's life due to the vast amount of information from different chroniclers during John's time and after. However, we can look into John's reign with more details as there exists plenty of court rolls and documents from his time as king. Like his father before him, John was an efficient administrator, but Unlike his father and brother Richard, John lost his biggest battles, which set the stage for his rather dull and painful end. Let's look at what some of the chroniclers of John's time stated about him and slightly after his death in 1216. No one may ever trust him, for his heart is soft and cowardly. This short quote perfectly summarizes a good amount of the opinions of contemporary chroniclers on King John. Here is a more extended quote from a Flemish anonymous contemporary chronicler from the 13th century. A very bad man, more cruel than all others, he lusted after beautiful women, and because of this he shamed the high men of the land, for which reasons he was greatly hated. Whenever he could, he told lies rather than the truth. He set his barons against one another whenever he could. He was very happy when he saw hate between them. He hated and was jealous of all honorable men. It greatly displeased him when he saw anyone acting well. He was brimful of evil qualities. Let's not mention Henry I's lover palace in Oxford, although the same Flemish account goes on to state, but he spent lavishly, he gave plenty to eat, and did so generously and willingly. People never found the gate or doors of John's hall barred against them, so that all who wanted to eat at his court could do so. At the three great feasts, he gave robes aplenty to his knights. This was a good quality of his. Other Middle Ages chroniclers have stated that John was nature's enemy, infinite curses on his own perfidious head. And one final quote from where John was clearly in Hal, according to Matthew Paris. Foul as is Hal, John's presence there makes it fouler still. John's reputation of being a villain and an evil man carries on into the Victorian age, with the historian William Stubbs offering the following historical assessment of King John. The very worst of all of our kings, polluted with every crime that could disgrace a man. We must, however, throw shade at the Victorians, the worst medievalists. 
who destroyed so much of what remained of Middle Ages art and architecture. I'm specifically referring to medieval doom paintings. Moving on to modern historians, there is one quote that summarizes John's kingship so perfectly I doubt anyone could improve or top this quote. He sowed mistrust and eventually rebellion. This was perhaps not an evil king, nor even the pantomime villain of later legend. John lacked neither brains nor guile, but his political intelligence, like his personality, was warped by cruelty, dishonesty and mistrust. In terms of events being described as biblical disasters, such as crops failing being a sign of poor kingship, during King John's reign, there was only one reported year in which the harvest failed in 1203. If there were more, then no doubt they would have been used as examples by contemporary chroniclers for even more condemnation of John's reign. But what made John a villain in the first place? Was it the mysterious death or murder of his nephew, Arthur, Duke of Brittany, or John's treatment of his subjects? Or was John's personality just so egregiously bad? If we look at the history of William the Marshal, a source written less than a decade after John's death and portrays a romanticized life of the Marshal, the following text gives us the classical portrayal of John as a paranoid, villainous snake. When he left Rouen, he had his baggage train sent on ahead, secretly and silently at Bonneville. He stayed the night in the castle, not in the town, for he feared a trap, believing that his barons had sworn to hand him over to the King of France. In the morning, he slipped away before daybreak, while everyone thought he was still asleep. This is during the period where King John was beginning to lose his lands in France to one of the most powerful and impressive kings of France to ever wear the crown, Philip II, or better known as Philip Augustus. This is also where John gained another nickname for himself, Soft Sword. He already had one nickname, Lackland, allegedly granted by his ever-loving father, Henry II. Before we explore King John's history and the impact it left on British history, let's first try and get to know him, with evidence of his personality and what hobbies he enjoyed. Let's start with John's hobbies. A typical hobby for a noble during the Middle Ages, hunting. King John loved hunting, as did his father Henry II. Even during a time when King John should have been conducting warfare in Normandy in 1204, he still took the time for a vigorous hunt. Perhaps for the freedom it offered, as this quote from the late 12th century by Richard Fitzneil from the Dialogue of the Exchequer. It is in the forest too that king's chambers are and their chief delights, for they come there laying aside their cares now and then to hunt as a rest and recreation. It is there they can put from them the anxious turmoil native to a court and take a little breath in the free air of nature. John made sure he would have a good hunt in Normandy as he imported wild animals such as foxes, otters, badgers, deers and even wild boars to be hunted with hounds or birds of prey, which leads us to John's next hobby, falconry. John was quite attached to his birds of prey, and one particular falcon, named Gibbon, was John's favourite. The bird was fed meat richer than most peasants could have. King John ordered Gibbon to be, well fed with plump goats and good hens, with hair once a week. John had a flair for interior design, ordering the refurbishment of many properties around England after his losses in France, from castles, hunting lodges, and palaces. John and his court were constantly on the move around his kingdom, so John made sure that his properties 
was suitable for his tastes and standards, as he would spend between one to three days at these locations. He certainly had enough money to spend. Winchester was one of John's favourite locations to stay at. Maybe one reason is that the beds there were sturdy, as the last hobby we will mention is that John enjoyed sleeping around. His passion for lovemaking is one reason he's condemned by some chroniclers. John fathered many illegitimate children, and he faced accusations before and after his death of lusting after the wives and daughters of his barons. Yet there is no solid evidence of these claims, and if we compare John with his predecessors, his father had many lovers, and his great-grandfather, Henry I, had so many children that we don't know the exact number. Now we will try to look into John's personality, which varies depending on the source. We can gauge parts of John's character with various attributes, such as arrogance, a superiority complex, vanity, paranoid and untrustworthy which so far are all negative. Yet, most of these traits do surface in the story of King John, as his nephew perished under his care. For a lighter characteristic, we have records of John's dry wit and humour. As this quote tells us, when the king told Robert that his lord, the Count of Flanders, had landed at Sandwich, Robert asked why he wasn't already on his way to see him, Listen to the Fleming, said the king. He thinks his lord, the count, really counts for something. By Saint Jack, replied Robert. I'm right, that he does. John laughed and rode so fast to Canterbury that most of his staff, their horses exhausted, were left behind. He went straight to Ferran's lodgings, greeted him courteously, and invited him to dine with him the next day. The quote is just a taste of John's personality, and as we go forward in his story, we'll come across more of his traits in the following episodes. For the final part of this particular episode, we will listen to a first-hand account describing John from Gerald of Wales, who accompanied John, who at the time was 18 years old, on his journey to Ireland in order to claim the lordship. Previously, Gerald had described John's other brothers, Richard and Geoffrey, in negative terms. The other, led away by the fervour of youth, and ensnared by its passions, is prone to vice and rude to his monitors, lending himself to the seductions of his time of life, instead of resisting the impulses of nature. Hitherto, therefore, by reason of his age. He is more given to pleasures than to arms, to dalliance than to endurance, to juvenile levity, more as yet than to manly maturity, which he has not attained. He employs most of his time in those evil courses which gallants pursue, by which even youths who are naturally good are often roused to feats of arms and soar from the camp of Cupid to the arts and towers of Pallas. As, then, he has obeyed the laws of green youth, so he will conform to those of subsequent age. Since, therefore, it is no disgrace to have enjoyed the pleasures of youth, but the shame lies in not bringing them to an end. Juvenile levity is excusable if the mature age be commendable and that stage of life is blameless if age sets bounds to indulgence. The tree which bends its boughs downwards cannot strike deep roots. This is the last of the three brothers. May he not be the last in virtue, but being always dutiful to both his parents, may his days be long and prosperous on earth. May he as truly conform to the description given by Merlinus Ambrosius, in a prophecy much noised abroad, of the man before whom the walls of Ireland shall fall. As he appears to answer it, his beginning, it says, 
shall be abandoned to loose living, but his end shall waft him to heaven. The next episode will explore John's early life as the son of the king.